Good afternoon and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. I'm Joseph Sani. I'm the Vice President of the Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace, which was established by Congress in 1984 as a nonpartisan public institution dedicated to uh, prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflict, violence conflict abroad. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here and to this event co-hosted by the US, uh, the United States Committee for Refugee and uh, Immigrants, as well as the International Organization for Migration, IOM. We'll be discussing the report of migration in East and the Horn of Africa report. The inaugural report was co-published by IOM, the East African Community, and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, on Development, IGAT. We are grateful to be joined by the IOM leadership, as well as US CRI. Thank you for your partnership in convening this critical conversation. I would like to thank the ambassadors, chargé d'affaires and representatives of the republics of Tanzania, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Sudan for joining us today. I would also like to thank all of you in the audience here at the United States Institute of Peace. It's a hot day, and so I sincerely appreciate you making the join. <laughs> and I would also like to thank you, our audience, following us in our various streaming platforms. Thank you so much for joining us. And finally, we are all honored to be joined by Eskinde Nigash, who is the president of the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, and also Director General Elect Amy Pope, who will be giving short remarks uh, at some point. Thank you. The goal of today's event is to provide an opportunity to unpack the findings of the report and the implication to the US-Africa relationships, as well as how the findings can inform US engagement with regional institutions, governments, and the people of Africa, particularly in this at this time, where the continent is going through transformative changes, both at the security level, economic, and political uh, aspects. So the report findings and recommendations provide critical perspectives on several priorities underpinning the US-Africa strategy, including strengthening US-Africa trade relations and investments, deepening US engagement with the African Union and the regional economic communities, and combating climate change, conflicts, and all the drivers of forced displacement. Thank you again for joining us to this important conversation. Now I would like to pass the floor to my friend, Eskinder Nigash, for some short remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, First, uh, it's so uh, wonderful to see Amy Pop, uh, someone I work with uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so we are so delighted, Amy, that you are going to be the next IOM Director General. So we are very, very grateful. Thank you. And I also want to recognize uh, Mr. Mohammed, uh, the IOM Regional Office. Uh, we have been working with him, talking to him. I actually went to see him about two months ago. So thank you very much for this uh, and, uh, groundbreaking report that you did with Sion and Azur uh, Okani. So thank you very much. So you may be wondering why USCRI is interested on this one. So in 1968, uh, I believe at that time, uh, President Eisenhower asked USCRI 
uh, to commission in terms of reporting the, the migration and refugee issues. So since 1968, uh, the USCRI, uh, a nonprofit organization, we are not uh, a government entity, it's not Congress designating us, but President Eisenhower saw after the war in 1968, they asked USCRI to commission the re report. So since 1968, we have been reporting on a global scale in terms of refugees and migration. Uh, so when we found out, you know, this uh, uh, groundbreaking report, we felt that th they are speaking actually our language. Um, this is the first comprehensive report as far as I know, but maybe there are some people who know that, uh, especially focusing on East Africa. Uh, since then, we spent almost uh, 25 years dedicating on South Sudan issue. Some of you remember, uh, I, I see Kathleen here, Roger Winter, who actually championing the South Sudanese issue for many, many years. And we continue to publish a lot of reports when, when it comes to East Africa and also other places. Uh, so this is a very important uh, publication for us with a lot of things in this report we found interesting in terms of mobility, in terms of integration, which is we have been really advocating for, for, long, for a long time. But I wanted to take a few minutes and give you a little bit of historical perspective what this Africa in terms of uh, migration, but I will be focusing on refugee uh, issues. As you know, uh, the migration in Horn of Africa started going back to 1955 when the crisis happened in South Sudan. And then from that, in 1957, where well, the crisis again in Rwanda, the first uh, uh, genocide in Rwanda happened. Uh, and then we continue with that in 1968. We still have refugees in East, Eastern Sudan, Eritrean refugees, been there since 1968. And, and I was uh, privileged to work in uh, the 80s and the, at the end of the uh, 1970s. And then, of course, we have dead up since 1991. Um, and there is, you know, the, you know, I have been to the DAB. I have seen, you know, second generation refugees in, in the DAB. Uh, and the DAB is not actually a good, a good place for human being. I remember uh, the Guardian uh, publishing a report saying that this is not really for a human being. Um, and then, you know, uh, I just, uh, from there, I think I, some of you remember, we have also in East Africa, we have seen more genocide than any other place in the world. You know, we have Rwanda's 1957, Burundi 1972, uh, 1994, uh, and Rwanda, and of course, uh, Darfur, and, and so on. So this report, and, and the migration report, and the refugee issues is, is very, very critical for IOM, for UNHCR, and for international community. As some of you already know, there's a lot of experts in this uh, audience. The 1951 convention actually talks about this issue, about integration, about mobility, about the right to work. All of that is really not new. Unfortunately, you know, we decided uh, to do a refugee camp rather than, you know, giving refugees to move from one location to another location to make a, a, a living. Uh, some of you remember that the 1951 convention doesn't actually mention about camp. There is nothing in that report mentioning about camp. So for the past 60, 70 years, we have practiced uh, this refugee containment. Means refugees staying in a camp, uh, not having a chance to go to school, not to work, not to move from one location to another location. Uh, so very much what USCRI, we used to call it for about 15 years, refugee warehousing. And we have practiced that. And my hope is this report, uh, again, you know, given that you know, the Uganda agreement, I am uh, under new leadership and then supported by President uh, Ruto, Kenya, and others who are really taking this issue, including IGAD, will change the dynamic. Our hope is after 70 years of refugee warehousing in Somalia and in, in Eritrea and in other places, it is about time we take this report and we support this report. The ideals in this report are something worth considering and supporting. I think, you know, I think this is the right time with a new leadership we believe we can change this dynamic and give refugees the, yeah, the right to work, the right to move, the right to own a property, 
and to have the dignity that they deserve as human beings. Um, I know I was given five minutes, but um, I, I told someone here I paid $14 for Uber, so I'm going to take it. <laughs> uh, there, there, is, uh, there is an African proverb, uh, since I'm also from East Africa. Uh, the, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The, the second best time is, is now. So we have went through this practice of refugees, Containment, I think this is about time. Take advantage of this report. Use it, expand it. I think we should support uh, the US government, foundations, international actors should really encourage this kind of engagement. So again, uh, Mick, good to see you. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how happy it makes me to follow Iskinder, who has been a um, longtime friend and colleague and ally in addressing the needs of some of the most vulnerable people in the world. So, so thank you. Um, it is my honor to be here with all of you today and to preside over the Washington, D.C. launch of Migration in Eastern Horn of Africa report, which is co-published by IOM the East African Community, and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, EGAD. We are so pleased to be holding the launch here at the US Institute for Peace, which is not only a highly respected independent organization, but it has been a real partner and a friend to us at IOM. And we're thankful that President Grandi has been able to deliver the keynote speech at a recent event that IOM hosted at Howard University. And we hope to continue the strong partnership that we've had to date. So initially released on May 2nd in Nairobi, Kenya, with the presidents of Kenya and Somalia, if I'm recalling correctly, this report really focuses on what regional integration will mean for the movement of people, the development on the African continent and in the sub-region. And I have to say, it's a testament, really, to IOM's own growth and thought leadership. And I'm looking at you, uh, my colleagues from the Eastern Horn of Africa Regional Office, and Mohamed Abdigar, who's our regional director there, as well as the commitment of the regional economic communities and the African member states to really start to think much more strategically about how we harness the benefits of migration and human mobility so that we can lead to greater political stabilization and economic development. Quite simply, human mobility is at the heart of, it is the foundation of the African Union's Agenda 2063, which envisions an integrated continent, politically united and based on the ideals of Africa's Renaissance. And I'm convinced that together, we can deliver on these promises, on the promises of human mobility. Migration is first and foremost about people. I know that sometimes when we look at the news reports, we can forget that it's first and foremost about people. And my view is that we at IOM can enable and unlock the potential that exists when people migrate. And my commitment within our organization is to ensure that we are keeping people at the center of what we do, whether it's the migrants themselves, the vulnerable populations, the communities that we serve, our member states, our partners, and our workforce. And in this respect, this report provides critical insights into how African governments, the regional economic communities, the citizens within the countries, and the migrants themselves can really seize the benefits of migration. You see, when we facilitate the free movement of goods, services, and people, regional integration has the transformative power to catalyze socioeconomic opportunities, move households out of poverty, increase the shared prosperity of African countries and their citizens. 
Deeper regional integration will empower migrants. It will enable member states to tackle joint challenges, including peace building, security, climate change, and the drivers of political fragility and instability. When Iskander spoke about moving away from this camp modality, it's not just because that is the way that we ensure the human dignity of the people who have been housed in camps. It's because that is the way that we enable better economic and social outcomes for all people, not just the people living in camps. The report finds that when we link the free movement of goods and services and people, we can actually unlock the benefits of intra-African trade, including through the African continental free trade area, which is projected, if we do this well, to lift 30 million people out of poverty. So figuring out how to enable the free movement of people is actually critical to the successful implementation of this free trade agreement. A key piece of this is thinking much more strategically about labor migration. We must take full advantage of the African diaspora for development. And we need to recognize that while we must counter brain drain, we must enable the exchange of people and ideas, of skills, of competencies to lead to benefits for people within and across the continent. We're already doing a lot of this work at IOM. We're working on border management and cross-border health systems. We have the joint program on labor migration governance. We have regional policy dialogues. But that's not enough. We need to build and enable the partnerships that, enable, that allow us to deliver really on these promises of migration. It's great to have these dialogues, but if the dialogue is not followed by action, then we're not doing our job. I'm confident that if we not only read the report, which I highly commend to you, but if we act upon the report's recommendations, we can turn this vision into reality. I've got to say, I'm really excited that this report is coming out at this moment in time, particularly in terms of US and Africa relations. And I'm very pleased to have Elizabeth Campbell here from the US government. We know the United States is taking an increased awareness and role in recognizing the importance that the continent will play in responding and defining global challenges of the future. And the 2022 strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa reframes the traditional US policy objectives, including advancing democracy and governance, peace and security, trade and investment, and economic development so that we're really reflecting Africa's contributions, Africa's inputs and priorities, and Africa's potential as a powerhouse of economic growth, of economic innovation, and of global leadership. The State of Migration Report demonstrates that regional integration and safe, orderly, regular human mobility they are conducive to a mutual US-Africa partnership and policy priorities, whether we're talking about increased trade, investment partnerships, policy priorities, fostering peace and political stabilization, or just building more resilient communities and more responsive institutions that are prepared to respond to the challenges of our future. And it has the potential to reinforce and shape the 2022 strategy for the mobility patterns and the trends that will and are affecting Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm extremely excited to hear what our panelists have to say. I am extremely excited about the potential for action as we build awareness of what we can do collectively as a global community. And I'm very grateful to all of you for joining us for this important conversation this afternoon. So thank you.
I will welcome our panelists, our panel, our panel members here. Please, to the stage. Sonny was, I think, supposed to introduce us, but I will give him a pass. Thank you, for, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Cheatham, and I'm moderating this conversation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I really thank you all, uh, distinguished guests, for, for joining us today, and, and thank you, panelists, for, for, for joining us for this conversation. First, allow me just to introduce everyone here for the discussion. Um, uh, Ms. Sion Terese Abebe, she's the chief editor of the report on the state of migration in East in the Horn of Africa, and she's also a leading policy analyst on migration and forced displacement at IOM, and the chief editor of this flagship report. She's spoken on major global <coughs> platforms such as the Commission on the Status of Women, the Global Refugee Forum, and the Aswan Forum. Sion also represented the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants in Ethiopia. She's an expert on migration, both forced migration and other forms of migration. We're so happy to have you here today. Ms. Elizabeth Campbell, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, you are the Deputy S Assistant Secretary for the U.S. State Department Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. We're really, really happy that you will be with us today. And you served in your position as Deputy Assistant Secretary since 2022. Prior to that, you were a director of the, U the UN Relief Works Agency for Palestine Refugees and the representative office here in Washington. And we thank you for all your hard work. You've had a distinguished career, and I won't go on more about that. Ms. Yimsarich Benalfo, thank you for coming very far from, uh, from Djibouti to join us today from the, from the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. And you, you serve as the coordinator for the Migration Policy uh, Implementation Project. And we're, we're happy to hear your views from the EGADS perspective. Uh, Ms. Benalfo previously worked for the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, integrated into the Swiss Embassy on the outskirts of Addis Ababa. You were responsible for the migration and protection program there. And as a coordinator at EGAD's Migration Policy Implementation Project, you advocate for a strong link between regional integration and human mobility and the potential to achieve development, development benefits for, for countries. So thank you all for being here today, and I really appreciate it. I, I read through the whole report. I, I didn't read it word for word, but I... But, there's not, well, yes, I think that's actually, a, no, no. But I do have a very well, I, I showed, I showed uh, the colleagues before, I, I uh, really did read through everything, and I found it really, really um, important and riveting. I thought, riveting might not be the right word, but, but, I, but the data, the data rich uh, um, resources in the, in the report were really striking, and I really thought that it was really important to talk about the positive aspects of regional integration and human mobility for strengthening the East African and Horn of Africa countries. And here at USIP, as Sani said, we work to, to help prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. And so, so often, we're looking at sort of the, the forced migration aspects, as we've spoken about, and the report certainly speaks to that. But I know it looks forward to more positive things, more, more ways in which the, the region can work together with the broader continent and partners internationally to try to bring uh, economic development, employment, and, and, and a sense of, of good management and political integration along with the full regional integration. So I thought that that was really a good <laughs> refreshment. I just came from the region. I was in Nairobi last week, and we were talking about the, the conflict in Sudan, um, which is obviously something that's, that's really horrible. It took place uh, after the writing of this report, and, but it's an issue that nonetheless will be very much prominent in considering migration issues uh, going forward, and, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about how that might be, how the findings in the report might, might be adapted for, for the new developments, as, as we all have to do. I, I was struck by the context in the first, in the first part, and I'll just gonna, I just want to read a few of the, the scene setting context pieces that were in, in the front of the report that, that, that have, like I said, some of these statistics that are very important. And the report claims, I mean, it doesn't claim, it states that labor migration represents a key component of the mobility landscape with 4.7 million migrant workers. But you know, there is also 22.3 million displaced persons, which includes 16.9 internally displaced, 16.9 uh, million internally displaced, and 5.4 million refugees and asylum seekers. As we said, the drivers of conflict, violence, climate-related disasters 
um, have, have caused these numbers of, of displacement and, and refugees. And it's, uh, it's, it's very prominent in the region. Ongoing conflicts in the DRC, Ethiopia, Somalia, South Sudan, and, and Sudan are, are amongst the, the largest outflows of refugees in all of, of Africa. But what was also striking is that 93% of the refugee population remained in the region. And several countries in the region are major refugee countries of destination, while simultaneously being major refugee countries of origin. And instead, this, the report states that no other subregion in the world shares this same characteristic. And I, I found that really, really striking. Um, these are just, I could go on and on about the context, but I know there's much more important things to talk about in the findings and the recommendations. And I, I would like to tar start with you, Sian, to talk about, as one of the lead authors, the key findings and recommendations that you would like to highlight, and especially here in this audience, what you think the most important findings and, uh, to highlight would be for U.S. policymakers, leaders, or leaders and U.S. partners for the region. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, Good afternoon to all of you. It's my pleasure to be here and share with you my perspectives about this report, the state of migration in East and Horn of Africa. Thank you really for making time to join us. I would like to focus on three key issues. Number one, benefits of regional integration and human mobility in the context of East and Horn of Africa. Second, factors that make human mobility safe, orderly, and regular. Third, enablers of regional integration and human mobility. I would like to conclude by highlighting some perspectives that contribute to the betterment of the US policy at the end. Regional integration is a process whereby countries agree to have a common system, politically, economically, legally, as you know. And in the context of Africa, this happens either at the regional level, which is the East African Community IGAD, or continentally. And in this report, actually, as Amy mentioned, we strongly argue that regional integration is about people. We need to sit down and ask ourselves, why are our countries integrating? It's for the people. So the mobility of people really matters for an effective regional integration to happen. As a labor migrant myself, coming from Ethiopia, working in Kenya, although I'm an international worker, and don't fall really under the regional integration uh, mechanism for now, I really wonder if I would see the full potentials of regional integration in my lifetime. Practical questions come to my mind, such as, can I see my bank in Kenya, standard and chartered, in the streets of Addis Ababa a few years down the line, and benefit from its excellent service? Can I have my Ethiopian coffee in cafes, restaurants across Africa, and don't need to carry my coffee every morning because our coffee is very special, as you know? <laughs> and can I or my children pack our bags and just to travel for leisure or anything, from Casablanca, Morocco, to Cape Town, South Africa, from Dakar, Senegal, to Djibouti, which is next door. Can this happen? I have these kind of practical questions. And these are not distant dreams, by the way. Because when we look at the developments, particularly in the eastern part of Africa, we have the East African communities that issues common passport, common ID cards, particularly between Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. So maybe we'll see this in the near future. Now let me go back to my three key points. Uh, the report has established that trade and labor mobility are the two critical benefits of regional integration and human mobility in the context of Africa and Eastern of Africa. 
regional integration fosters trade. Intra-EAC, East African trade, for example, has increased to 4.36 billion USD in 2021 from 3.36 billion USD in 2020. And the mobility of persons is a critical dimension that makes trade happen. In this regard, the African continental free trade area plays a significant role in making trade and the mobility of persons happen, particularly through its commitments such as trading in goods, trading in services, and investment commitments. Regional integration also advances labor mobility through addressing different barriers to employment through the right kind of policy making process. Access to work, mutual recognition of skills, portability of social security benefits are critical for labor mobility to happen at the regional level. And the East African community in this regard is making some major progress in encouraging its member states to address such kind of challenges and also, for example, to really uh, get rid of work permit fees. And IGAD is also making different efforts to encourage its member states to do the same. According to the report, there are Four important factors that make human mobility safe. These are health, climate change, gender, and sustainable reintegration. And for this session, I would like to focus on two of them, health and climate change. Regional integration and human mobility require people-centered, I really want to focus on this, people-centered health systems. And these health systems, as we have learned from COVID-19, are quite critical to facilitate movement of goods, services, and people. And the mobility-responsive primary healthcare system with cross-border universal health coverage is necessary for effective regional integration and human mobility. The report also calls for enhanced approaches when it comes to climate change challenges. Mobility patterns are constantly changing, particularly in the Horn of Africa, we have seen one of the worst droughts in 40 years, which is a testimony that individual countries cannot handle this by themselves. They need to approach it individually. We have seen this enough in terms of drought and everything. To cite my personal experience, as a five-year-old or four-year-old girl, I didn't travel for the first time for vacation to the beach or something. I traveled for the first time to deliver food to my grandparents, whom we heard at the time were facing drought. So we have heard this experience this for years we need a serious regional approach to address uh, this situation. And in this regard, regional integration provides excellent opportunity to address it, as we have seen in the 2022 Kampala Declaration on Environment, Climate Change, and Migration, which was adopted in the run-up to COP27. And this declaration is interesting. In a sense, it doesn't only talk about the mobility of people associated with climate change, but also livestock, which is very important in our region. Last but not least, the report argues that integrated border management and digitalization are enablers of regional integration and human mobility. Integrated border management is an enabler of not only movement of people, goods, and services, but it's also a catalyst for regional integration and human mobility to happen. The adoption of the EAC passport, which I mentioned earlier, is the strongest demonstration in our region that regional economic communities, countries, can facilitate mobility of people. One stop border posts demonstrates the promise and potential of the integrated border management approach in 
better advancing human mobility. Regional integration also unlocks digitalization as it encourages RECs and member states to invest in digitalization infrastructure linked to digital uh, situations and so on. And digitalization, so many people assume it is very far from Africa, but what we are seeing now is we are having digital IDs, passports, digital financial systems like M-Pesa, a lot of things are happening. So digitalization is a real enabler. Finally, I would like to conclude by highlighting a couple of points which the US policymakers can, might find important in enhancing the existing policies, including the Sub-Saharan Africa strategy. And the first one is really to look at closely the important role regional economic communities play in setting very important geopolitical agendas, such as class change, uh, border management issues, counter-terrorism, mobility of persons, they have a real agenda setting role. So closely working with them will benefit the US government to stabilize countries and support the development. The other key thing the US government needs to pick from this process is not to treat migration as a challenge and an emergency only, but rather as a very positive development, it's a natural development, and we need to tap into it and turn it into a socioeconomic opportunity, which the regional economic communities in our countries, as they have clearly stated, including in the Agenda 2063, that this mobility of persons has the power to turn our current situation into something positive. So uh, we hope the US government will take these uh, points into consideration in um, advancing uh, its uh, support to our member states. With this, I conclude uh, my reflection. Back to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Sion. Thank you so much for those reflections. And that, that you know, that's exactly what I, I took away. Uh, my big takeaway was the positive aspects of migration and working to support that. Deputy Assistant, Assistant Secretary Campbell, uh, now turning to you. Your, your bureau is focused on population, refugees, and migration. So from the report, what are your key takeaways for U.S. policy and partnerships in the region? Yeah, thank you so much. And it's really such a pleasure to be here and to be talking about this report. Sorry which I agree with you, Askinder, is um, unique and important and arguably long overdue. I think, as all of you know, uh, promoting safe, orderly, and humane migration is a top priority of the, of the president um, and the, the secretary, and something um, in which PRM is deeply and centrally engaged. And this is a really exciting moment because we're in a moment a dynamic moment, and I think when I read the report and the findings, what jumps out at me is its comprehensive nature. We as a broad, let's just call ourselves a broad community interested in these issues, human mobility, refugees, migrants, no matter the reason, no matter the cause, it's presenting a comprehensive um, picture, and it is, it is telling us it's time to break down the silos and to start looking at things not only from a national uh, perspective, but indeed um, from a regional perspective. And that's, that's really important. Second, it puts climate at the center. Again, this is a top priority of the Biden administration, something that we in PRM are talking about and engaging in daily to figure out beyond the policy that many of you may have seen or read, how do we actually operationalize that? as a top donor, historically a humanitarian donor, a donor that has um, worked particularly in, in refugee uh, settings, how do we begin to think about what we do about people on the move because of climate? That is 
really a policy shift for many of us. Um, and it's not just a humanitarian question, right? As all of you know, it's a development question, it's a private sector question, it's a peace building question. Um, and so finding our way in that conversation, it's a very exciting time to be in the administration. And this report helps us. Um, the third piece is, and this is I think a little bit, Eskinder, what you were getting at, is that when we think about migration and the opportunities, right? This is the exciting part. It's not migration and the challenges, but migration and the opportunities. It also tells us that solutions are not finite, right? Um, maybe there is a, a short-term solution for a particular individual or population that may change in the future. I think for a long time, many of us who've worked in this field, we've sort of been stuck in this idea that, that, that you know you have to kind of wait where you are, and then there will be, in the distant future, a solution that will be a permanent solution to the challenges that you face um, as a vulnerable migrant or someone who's forced his place. But this report tells us, no, there's different ways. Some of the solutions may be temporary, some of them may be longer term, um, but there's different ways of getting at that. And I think that is also uh, very exciting. And as mentioned um, by my colleague, I think what is also exciting about this report is that it is about um, African human mobility. It is not about what do we do, it is not about juxtaposing um, the challenge with other continents let's say on the other side of the Mediterranean, it is really about looking at this inside the continent. And as you know, 70% of African migrants are moving within the African continent. They are not leaving the continent. So that is the correct framing. We should all be looking in partnership um, with African member states about how we um, uh, address these opportunities. If I may, just say a couple of things about some of the priorities very specifically that we're working on. You mentioned Kenya, and Kenya is sort of a global case study of maybe how not to do things well, in the sense that you know, we in the United States have supported for over 30 years um, some 600,000 refugees residing in that country, of course, with the generous support of the Kenyan authorities and agreement of the Kenyan authorities. And it's not that we, we regret that, but after 30 years, one has to ask, <laughs> after hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Livelihoods um, sort of, you know, uh, that have been dashed, educational opportunities that have been squandered, what is a better way of doing that? And it, again, is a very exciting moment because from President Rutu down, the Kenyan government has decided to, well, I mean, take a completely different approach. And we want to stand in partnership with them on that journey. And that approach, basically, and thanks to its new law that it passed in 2021 and makes it possible, is all about inclusion, right? And it gets back to the, the basis of this report. It's about, finally, freedom of movement. It is about easy access to work permits. It's about documentation. Um, and ultimately, hopefully, labor mobility um, in the region. This is revolutionary, or it is certainly a huge step forward. And it is that type of policy environment and opportunity that we in PRM are poised to support and hopefully hold up as an example of what can be done in other parts um, of, of East Africa in particular, but the continent um, in general. And this also means working hand in glove as sort of close partners, not only with our, our large sort of IO and humanitarian partners, but also with the private sector, which is, has to be at the center driving a lot of this, the multilateral development banks um, and other development actors. Um, um, Second, I had mentioned uh, climate migration, but again, this is something that we're looking very particularly um, at in Kenya, and we're thinking about ways, again, to operationalize this policy um, that is now, I think, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of this policy. Um, and it, again, it's an exciting way for us to also, um, I often say, build new muscle memory inside the US government about how we do this. What, how are we conceptualizing the problem? And then what are the tools at our disposal to begin to address it? Um, so that's something I hope that we can continue to make good progress on. Um, then I just wanted to mention a couple of other things. Um, one of the innovations um, that this administration has worked on and my colleague at PRM is something called the Welcome Corps, which is about private sponsorship of refugees. And it is a way to 
um, engage average Americans in the important refugee resettlement work that we do together, and of course in partnership with IOM. But a piece of that innovation um, is something called Welcome Core Campus. I hope I have that right. But it's about um, an innovative legal lawful pathway of bringing refugees through an education channel, meaning that universities can sponsor refugees to come. So this, again, is just one example of innovation and something that we're trying to push forward in this administration to begin to think about different ways that we can operationalize um, lawful pathways. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention without dwelling um, too much, but um, the work that our colleagues are doing in the Western Hemisphere on these so-called safe mobility offices is very exciting because we hope eventually it can be um, replicable in other regions. And I think definitely East Africa would be an example of a place where you could set up a similar model. The idea, for those of you who don't know, very simply, is that those um, folks on the move can apply through these centers for a wide variety of pathways, which may include access to asylum or the US Refugee Admissions Program or labor pathways. And those labor pathways don't have to be to the United States or Canada. It can They can clearly be uh, within the region um, and other, um, other channels. So again, I think that is a way that we are all trying to work together to be part of what you clearly have articulated in this report, which is um, a broader integration and a broader conceptual conceptualization of human mobility and the various components of it. Thank you so much, very much. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. And Ms. Bonafo, thank you. Um, turning to the regional economic communities and the work uh, you do at EGAD, and it's unfortunate that our colleagues from the EAC couldn't be with us today, but um, you work on the on strengthening the implementation of EGAD's migration policies. And could you tell us about within the context of the findings of the report, what your priorities right now for those policy implementation plans are and sort of what you have on the horizon? Sure. And thank you. Um, thank you for having EGAT here. And I'm really pleased to, to also see uh, we have uh, three member states of EGAT here, namely Ethiopia, Sudan, and of course our new member, Eritrea. Um, of course, well, when it comes to our priorities, uh, you have, and as you rightly mentioned, the context you have migration, but you also have the forced displacement. So each also have their own respective uh, policy framework. When we look at the migration, you have the EGAD free movement of protocol on persons and transhumans uh, that was adopted in 2020. That actually allows uh, citizens within the EGAD region to move freely, um, so without uh, visa establish themselves and then reside. So, But this is a progressive uh, process that would allow uh, IGAD citizens uh, to move freely in that uh, regard. When we come to the, of course, that also looks at issues of qualification. I, you know, uh, we're not only looking, when we look at movement and mobility and uh, migrants, we're not, uh, we don't need to look at it in one uh, Profile. So you have the skilled ones, skilled laborers, you have the unskilled one. So what we want to see, when, especially when people move within the region, if they have the qualification, uh, their qualification, their certificate needs to be uh, recognized, whether they move from Ethiopia to Sudan or Kenya to uh, Uganda. So that kind of policy framework is another angle that we are advocating for. Third one is on labor migration. Uh, we, Because we know labor migration as a uh, a big topic for our member states. I mean, we have countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda that send uh, unskilled, I would say, domestic workers to the Gulf countries and Saudi Arabia and with lots of challenge, particularly protection issues and uh, con concerns uh, for the region and the countries. So that uh, framework actually advocates for labor migration to be in a regular manner that protects citizens so that they can, when they move, their rights are respected. And also when they return back, they have uh, possibilities for return in a safe manner. But that also allows uh, portability of social protection, also working with social partners such as uh, uh, what you call employers, association, and trade unions. So those are one, some of the main uh, policy frameworks on migration. When we come to displacement, 
Of course, uh, we all know our IGAD region, uh, the displacement figures keeps increasing. Unfortunately, we have more IDPs than um, refugees. I mean, uh, currently, without counting what's happening in Sudan, we have about uh, 12 million uh, internally displaced persons, and that keeps increasing. And then when you look at refugees, you have about 5.5 million refugees. That also is keeping in, keeps increasing. And I'm not uh, counting the current figure in Sudan, unfortunately. So that figure continues. So we have existing current humanitarian needs that countries, host countries that are struggling. At the same time, uh, we're also uh, um, looking for long-term solutions. Yes, you mentioned uh, from PRM, like your investment in Kenya for 30 years didn't, uh, well, re lead to self-reliance of refugees, if I were to say that. So what we want to see is uh, advocate for Im humanitarian needs for countries that are uh, to respond to the needs, but at the same time work on uh, long-term solutions. So durable solutions that would actually have Im meaningful impact on refugees, returnees, and host communities. So we look at them also um, in a co holistic manner, not uh, distinguishing between one group uh, per say. So that looks at um, aspects of education. So education, access to education system, that's such as nas uh, national education system. Uh, countries have already developed the coastal plan to include refugees in the national system. I would say that the majority of uh, IGAR countries have already done that but also including refugees into the national Tibet system so that they can actually get the training and subsequently, of course, uh, job creation that would change their life meaningfully. And then we have a policy framework on livelihood that looks at uh, improving uh, or creating the enabling environment. When I say enabling environment, we're looking at the policy environment, such as access to documentation for refugees. This could mean uh, work permit could mean access to finance, um, simply as opening, having a SIM card for refugees. Um, I mean, in Kenya, it's really impossible for a refugee to have a SIM card. In Pesa, uh, it does not recognize refugees. Your refugee ID is not recognized. So small uh, but meaningful uh, um, change. So documentation is one, and then we also advocate for uh, involvement of private sector and civil society for job creation of refugees. We all know that uh, no, the governments cannot hire everyone. Yes, there are currently different initiatives, such as in Ethiopia, where they did uh, try to hire or include refugees into the different national uh, investment plans. But the role of private sector is very critical. And then, of course, this livelihood uh, also looks at issues of natural resource, energy, but issues of return or reintegration. People would always move. Um, we cannot expect someone to be a refugee their entire life. So when they move back to their country, what kind of uh, system are in place? Can actually can they make an informed decision when they go back and re-establish themselves? The third aspect is on health. Health, again, similar to the education ones, um, access to he national health systems for refugees. Yes, there are currently initiatives that are happening across the region, but those are, the, uh, I would say, some of the key priorities um, f for now. Thank you so much, and I, I think the report really highlights great, great, great uh, recommendations for supporting returns and, and, and reintegration. And I know the, the um, colleagues had mentioned, uh, or actually, Ms. Pope, you mentioned uh, Ms. Grande, who, who's sorry she couldn't be here today, but she, she, some of her speech that she did with IOM was about hand, housing, land, and property rights, and how important that is in the context of migration, and especially for returnees and, and, and reintegration. Um, Ms. Benafu, can I just stay with you for a minute? Because you mentioned Sudan, and I think we would be remiss for not talking about how um, your policies that you're working on with EGAD, but also some of the findings of the report. I know that there, a lot of them are medium term and longer term priorities, but we have a lot of people newly suffering now from this, from this uh, humanitarian crisis. Are there any priorities that can be expedited from the report or your policies that could help um, alleviate some of the suffering and, and help with the dignity of those displaced from the, the conflict currently? Uh, when it comes to um, Sudan, I mean, currently, I mean, IGAD, um, along, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the quartet group, which includes Ethiopia, um, Kenya, South Sudan, and Djibouti, which was uh, recently established to find a um, solution for Sudan, uh, particularly on peace. Uh, um, 
yes, there were different attempts that were done because uh, I would say that the nexus between peace and mobility is very critical for us. And we all advocate uh, five, first that the root causes needs to be addressed because displacement will, or one of the drivers of displacement is conflict and political instability. So unless we address uh, the root causes of conflict in a holistic and inclusive manner, yes, it would have temporary solution, but uh, would not be um, uh, lasting. I mean, Sudan is a very good example. Yes, when we have the civilian government, when Hamdok came in power, I think we were all very excited. Even before that, when the Darfur conflict ended, I know here in DC, few years back, there was a strong uh, lobby uh, to stop the Darfur uh, crisis. So, but then, you know, those underlining issues, despite the different peace agreement, negotiation has not been really addressed. And then at the same time, you have also different actors working either to find solutions, either as enablers or spoilers. I mean, I think we all know that, right? So looking at this, well, the a peace as a long, inclusive peace process that which IGAD is currently working, I think one is supporting that process because it's very critical that we, uh, uh, it's now, I mean, if you can count the dates, it's more than, what, eight, seven days since the conflict started. Initially it was Khartoum, it uh, expanded to Darfur and then Kordofan, so, and then you have, uh, what, almost 2.2 million people that are dis uh, internally displaced and then about 500,000 uh, refugees just within this uh, few uh, days, 87 days more than. So, but that will continue because we still, uh, the, the two parties have not yet agreed. So we need to advocate first for peace, lasting peace. And secondly, um, the two parties need to come and sit together. Uh, yes, there are different uh, pro pro efforts that has been done, but that I think needs, I know the US is also very working closely with IGAD and the African Union, but I think um, supporting the IGAD process is very critical. I think having different approaches, that's one. And then meantime, uh, providing access to humanitarian needs. Yes, uh, it's, we have the neighboring countries such as Ethiopia, Chad, uh, South Sudan uh, are now receiving uh, on daily basis um, refugees. So those three countries also need to be supported. I know there are global, competing global priorities, whether it's in Ukraine and other countries, but those uh, we should not also forget uh, what's happening in the IGAD region and then provide humanitarian assistance to the refugees and IDPs. Thank you so much. We hope. We hope that something can, can help the, the situation there very much. Uh, Sian, I didn't ask you about this. Uh, I mean, I didn't prepare for this, but I just thought I would also be um, uh, failing in my moderation duties to talk about the aspects of the report that speak to the gendered uh, dimensions of migration, and because it's such an important part of the report, and um, it, it's mainstream throughout. So. Could you just say a few words about the findings and some of the aspects um, in the report that speak to, to, to gender aspects just before we turn to our uh, Q&A? Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, the gender aspect of uh, mobility of people and regional integration is something we have uh, given a very strong emphasis in our analysis and uh, thought because uh, we haven't only included a gender chapter, but we tried our best to mainstream gender throughout the analysis. So the key things that come out in this analysis is women actually take part in the regional integration and mobility aspect across the board. And they are the majority of the cross-border traders, for example. But now the unfortunate thing is they are into the informal sector, so in front of the formal sector they are invisible. And due to this, they are exposed to a number of uh, right abuses and so on. But at the same time, the positive thing is the regional integration processes and policies by the RECs, they are also very mindful of the gender perspective. So the different policies support women, you know, which is excellent. 
but the ability of the women to use those policies and advance their economic uh, independence or rights and so on, uh, still we need to do a lot. Because this is a very complicated process. It has to do with education, exposure, knowing your legal rights, and also be in the position where you pursue your rights. When you go and uh, through the uh, free movement uh, arrangements, you can cross the border using your ID card. That is a right. But now, uh, someone, a man, a gentleman standing on the uh, border posts will stop women and ask for a bribe. Now, do you uh, uh, argue with him or do you pay the bribe? If you don't pay the bribe, what will happen? So it's a very complicated process, and it's also it has to do with uh, the uh, cultural perspectives that don't value women as equal to men and a number of things. But again, I really want to emphasize our policymakers are very conscious of this. We have good policies, but we need to do a lot to enable women benefit from the mobility arrangements, the regional integration processes, and the benefits that include labor mobility and trade. So thank you. Thank you for that perspective. I think now we are turning to the question and answer period. We have about, I think, 10 minutes. I don't know who's helping me here, but we, uh, we've got some hands, and I'll just go ahead and do it. Um, well, actually, I'll start here. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would like to thank the uh, speakers for the well-articulated and uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, document is really uh, very, very, very important. But I would like to begin with the Sudan, since I'm um, from the Sudan. And, uh, and uh, to thank you also for raising the issue of Sudan, the current uh, conflict in Sudan, uh, which was uh, a, initiated by a, an, ins an insurgents, insurgents, a, a movement by a unit of the of the of the of the army in the in the in the Sudan, which unleashed this uh, uh, violence and this catastrophe in uh, in, in, in in the Sudan. So what we uh, there are many narratives, but but the 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 the, the, the narrative which um, everybody knows, including I think some of our colleagues here from the U.S. Uh, Institute who were in Sudan when the 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 the, the problem started on the 15th of, of April, is that the uh, rapid support forces, which was a part and parcel of the. Uh, national army uh, rebelled and took arm and then uh, the, 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 the story goes and uh, as we are speaking now they are occupying the citizens houses raping uh, you know and, uh, and uh, setting um, uh, checkpoints uh, taking human civilians uh, as, uh, as, as, as uh, human shields and uh, causing all this catastrophe. So as our sister from Djibouti said that uh, the priority now is uh, to stop this violence and to support the government of Sudan. This mutiny, if it takes place in any country, any name any country, uh, it will be confronted as the, uh, the Sudanese government is doing and maybe with the same also, uh, 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 with, with the same uh, tools of, 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 of confronting such a, a, a mutiny. So to stop the violence and the, the conflict and to assure that civilians go back to their occupied houses, uh, 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 refugee, uh, in, internally displaced people 
go back also to their houses because uh, you know Sudan is a big and vast country. Then the the, the conflict is in two states: the the capital city Khartoum, and there is uh, uh, another city, uh, state in the uh, western Sudan with the, the, with the borders with uh, with Chad, which is uh, western Darfur uh, uh, state. So this is a priority. What do we ask our our our, our brothers? And, 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 and colleagues in the region and the international community also is to support uh, the government of Sudan address this, uh, this issue and then after that uh, uh, there will definitely be a political process in the Sudan because it, ha it used to be uh, a political process but uh, due to the current developments it, 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 it is now it, it is stopped uh, so and, and uh, IOM and thanks to IOMF, they have a, a presence in Sudan for, for tens of years, and they are doing very, very important and, 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 and good work. And uh, the, the director general elect, we had also a, a meeting today, very big meeting with all African ambassadors at the African Union uh, mission here. Uh, we discussed these issues in, 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 in Africa. And I just want to remind you also as you promised us that you will visit the, the continent, and you said that you will visit uh, Ethiopia, and I hope that also you will visit the Sudan, uh, uh, because Sudan has uh, was one of the countries, uh, as one of our speakers here said, who, who, with the presence of, of, of of, of, of millions of refugees from the re regions uh, as our sisters and as our uh, b b brothers. Uh, so, uh, and Sudan is now used to be also a, a, a transit for, for, for illegal migration uh, or for migration, but it has become also a, a destination. Uh, due to the current uh, now situation, Sudan is becoming a source and an origin also of, 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 of migration. So you are welcome to visit Sudan and address. My question is uh, that uh, uh, this document, in fact, is a, a, a very important uh, document uh, on, on the state of migration in East Africa and East and Horn of Africa. And we can say that this is it's really a, a manual for, 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 for addressing this, this issue. Uh, and, uh, but how, and as I have seen here, yeah, we always have the uh, problem, the challenge of, of implementing uh, of, of recommendations, implementing of out, outcome of, of, of such research. Uh, mm -hmm. But such we have, uh, since we have this comprehensive document, so uh, I think uh, we, we need to concentrate on implementing and realizing the, 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 the uh, recommendations in, in, the, in the document. As it is stated here that 50 uh, uh, authors and, and, and contributors from the region and the continent and beyond contributed to the report. So in, in, in implementing and realizing the, 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 the recommendations, can, can we make use of some of these 50 contributors to help in, 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 in the implementation process, in, in realizing the, 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 the recommendations, in, in moving forward and finding out the, a way forward for, 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 for the doc We don't want this important document to be kept somewhere in one, at a corner in an office. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, IOM can play a role. Let us uh, engage some of these 50 contributors and authors in the implementation process it, it, itself. Can we do that? Thank you so much. Just we'll take note of your question. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for um, this opportunity to gather. Um, and we thank the United States uh, Institute of Peace. My name is Ambassador Robi Kakonge from Uganda. And mine is to say that um, on behalf of the government of Uganda and the people of Uganda, we commit to continuing in hosting the, the refugees. We host currently 1.5 million refugees. We have the one of the oldest uh, camps. Uh, we've had it since uh, um, the 50s. And uh, I just want to, um, you, you mentioned that the challenge now is 
the climate change and health, and especially when you look at uh, the livestock. And it's it's really I, I was in you um, when I was in Uganda last summer. You you could really it, it's beyond belief what can happen when you have families relying on the the livestock, and then because of climate change, like they the they really don't know what to do. They don't know if they should send their children to the city to work as as uh, as maids. If then, because then the city becomes crowded. If they send them to the Middle East, and then there there's so many issues. And we have the one of the youngest uh, populations in the world. Seventy percent of our population is under thirty years old. So, um, in when when it comes to implementing, I don't know what we're going to do or how we're going to do it. But I, I just uh, want us to continue in dialogue and make sure that we can do it together because things really can can happen. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll just give another example. There's uh, uh, da Ugandans in the diaspora, like the largest populations of Ugandans in the diaspora reside in Boston. I was just there over the weekend. And you, um, during COVID, and they, really, they now even have agencies to take care of the elderly and uh, so if we could find ways of certain communities, maybe piloting, where they can get skills, maybe telemedicine. I, again, I'm, I'm just really looking at how can we leverage telehealth and telemedicine and teleeducation to, to get ahead of, of some of these issues. So thank you. Oh, and, and by the way, um, congratulations. Uh, and I, I also want to to request that should you make that trip to Africa, when you make that trip to Africa, <laughs> Uganda is like forty five minute flight from Kenya. So, <laughs> and, and I'll be at the airport waiting for you. Thank you so much. Thank thank you very much. Uh, we we'll, we'll just pause and see if there's any responses to the implementation question or the the questions about how how we move forward to implement. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for that important question. Okay. Uh, thank you for that important question. And uh, this is really in line with what we are thinking uh, at IOM in, in the regional office. So uh, under the leadership of Mohammed, uh, the Eastern Horn of Africa office in Nairobi tends to be... Uh, forward looking and uh, what we do uh, what we did is uh, right after submitting the manuscript of the report for publication which as you know quite well takes quite a while to uh, print we have started thinking about what is next we have produced this report this many minders took part some of the best african minders i have to emphasize then why are we doing this? How are we using it to advance the region's agenda? So uh, after some reflection and really uh, appreciating the work of the Rex, uh, now we are in the process of thinking to establish a regional program on regional integration and mobility of persons, which I think is one of the most innovative ideas uh, that aims to support our regional economic communities and our member states to advance and uh, benefit from the power of migration and mobility and regional integration. So we are taking some baby steps. We are not yet there, but uh, we are thinking about the implementation aspect a lot. Thank you. Um, I would say governments in the region are already uh, implementing quite a lot. I think we need to acknowledge what governments are doing. Yes, there are uh, current uh, policy frameworks, but whether it's in Uganda, I mean, Uganda, in fact, is uh, very progressive in, in reintegrating refugees by providing land, but also um, access to different uh, national system, particularly the financial system using the private sector. So um, Uganda is, I would say, way ahead in the region. So, um, but then, of course, there are d d different challenges, uh, and then each uh, 
it's not one size fits for all. So each country has their own challenge, whether it's uh, resources, technical, financial, but also priorities. So country priorities might change, uh, looking at the current dynamics. So uh, we also need to acknowledge um, that pr priority shifting. But I want to emphasize that there are already existing processes that are happening, and we need to support the governments. I think governments should be the center. Um, that's my uh, pitch. Thank you so much. I think we have time for two more. I think there's one here and there's one in the back. I think in the back first and then here. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Mahari. Um, Andrew, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, but I want to also appreciate uh, Sion and Yemis Raj and also Mohammed Abdelkir, uh, Abdelkir uh, for he, your dynamic leadership and the, for this report. And may I also congratulate the director, general elect, uh, Amy Pop, for your victory. Uh, I want to emphasize on one point. I think most of you have emphasized, and I think Andrew rightly so, you characterize the report as pivoting towards more the opportunities, the positive narrative, and we, not, we need that. Africa needs the positive uh, uh, aspect, uh, optics in this kind of report, as most of the reports are, uh, of course, on the displacement, uh, uh, displacement in Africa. But I think it's very important we cannot hide ourselves or put our head in the sand uh, uh, when we deal about migration and its uh, relation with governance. Governance, governance, governance. Why am I saying that? Uh, in the report they are mentioned, but I think uh, as we speak, we have more than 44 million displaced persons in Africa. And the total displacement internationally is more than 100 million as we speak. This is a record high. Uh, now, Sudan, about 3 million, Ethiopia, close to that number, and DRC, which are both DRC, about close to 5 million, in the Horn of Africa and East Africa, is a big number. And at the center is actually misgovernance. Misgovernance of transition in Sudan, transition in Ethiopia, or other kind of misgovernance that we see. And my question is, we have been building for decades institutions like the UN Responsibility to Protect, including the African Union, IGAD, and others, to prevent or respond, to respond to the causes, the root causes of displacement and the bad aspects of migration, like trafficking and so on, even if we have the good migration or good uh, mobility. Now, my question is, are these institutions supposed to prevent, in the first place, from causing displacement or bad mobility trafficking? Are these institutions who are supposed to prevent, respond, even predict in some aspects, fit for the purpose after decades? And if it's not done, this kind of assessment and the adjustment is not done by countries like the US who have leverage, resource, or otherwise, capital, political, and diplomatic influence, or those institutions that have been established before, if they don't move towards that, like UN and others, can we really resolve the problems that we are talking? Or are we actually slow walking, uh, sleepwalking to a more displacement and uh, trafficking that will come uh, for us? Thank you for that. We'll just take one more, and then we'll let the panelists respond to both questions. I think in the front, the second row here. Ambassador. Okay. Sorry, told me not to pass my mic. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Matilda. I'm ambassador of Rwanda. And uh, first of all, congratulations, <laughs> Director Pope. We are so happy you are here. And thank you, the Institute of Peace, for convening this important meeting. We've worked with uh, IOM for, for quite some time, and especially when they were doing a database on diaspora. So that was, you know, and to see how we can really harness the importance of diaspora in the development of our countries, but also when it comes to migration and what can happen. One of the, and I like among the presenters that you've put out there is uh, really that dialogue, because country, countrywide, 
uh, I can, for instance, say my country has been always thinking out of the box when it comes to mo mo mobility and to migration and many different things because we have a big experience and history in being refugees as a whole nation. We, we, we lived in all these countries that we are talking about, whether it's Tanzania, whether it's Uganda, whether it's Burundi, and all the countries combined. So one of the, the and the main thing I'm talking about, uh, the dialogue, is that those kind of solutions that have been brought even in the, in the forefront, I can give you one specific example. Uh, when my president was the, heading the African Union uh, on that rotational base, he took the, uh, the opportunity to help the people who were dying in the, 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 the Mediterranean, coming from uh, Libya. And we allowed them to come and be uh, processed in the country of Rwanda. And all the, the steps that were taken, that we did again, we just partnered with the High Commissioner for Refugees to bring the people who want to come there, who are dying. There are many who are still dying. But to say, why don't you come in on the continent in Africa, like what you are saying, and then through a certain process that is well established, you can either decide to remain in the country or you can be resettled in a, in a third country that will accept you or you can go back to your country at one particular time in history. So those are the stuff that I think the dialogue, uh, as we go there, is really to, be, to put on the table all the people who can bring good ideas, especially in Africa. Because if you are talking about the East African community, uh, and you, you went over the, the fact that we, we have studied real-time integration. Uh, when we talk about even the African passport, this is not just a document. It has really changed our lives that I can go to any embassy in Washington, whether it's Tanzania, whether it's Kenya, whether it's Uganda, and I can do all the processes of any, uh, for instance, when you want to go and do your, uh, you are trying to, to travel in Africa, and you go from any entry point. So those are, are, are major things, major development. So what I would like to see uh, happening, and then my colleague from Sudan was talking about silencing the guns first before the freedom of movement. Because that can be uh, a, a very big impediment because even in our region, in the Great Lakes, sometimes because of insecurity, because of chaos, it's very difficult to have a circulation of uh, mo people and movement because of what is going on among countries and, and the states. So how are you going to broaden the scope of conversation uh, to go from this report and to say, these are the people who should be on the table to discuss those particular issues. Talking about security, talking about all these things that are here. And how is it going to look? Especially bringing the, the key partners in Africa, from Africa, because these are the people who should be in the forefront to also uh, give ideas that they might work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So those are the two questions we put to the panelists here. Um, first, is are, are, are institutions fit for purpose, which is something that's on a lot of people's minds? And secondly, how do we broaden the scope of the conversation and use the report as a catalyst for a broader discussion on the themes and, and with a broader uh, scope of, of stakeholders to discuss the issues? Anyone uh, here? Uh, just on the question about um, our institutions and are they fit for a purpose, this is, of course, something that has been also on the mind of the Biden administration, and it is in part why we ran Amy Pope for um, IOM. So it's a very, I don't know if it was a planted question, but, um, <laughs> but, but no, but in all seriousness, right, I mean, we all know this. These institutions were born out of a particular historical moment in response to a very specific thing that happened, right? And so I think we all agree, and we use words very broadly about the need for modernization and reform, which mean different things to different administrations. In this administration, what it means, and what it means in particular for IOM, um, under Amy's very able and dynamic leadership, is 
working across um, all of these various sectors. And this is why IOM is actually such a unique agency within the UN system. It can do everything from emergency humanitarian response to development, to peace building, to many other things. And having the expertise in a single agency and the ability to work across those so-called sectors or areas and to try to find a common um, or a more comprehensive solution to these very complex problems. And of course, you're completely right, right? If we're dealing on the response end, which is frankly where we put a lot of our resources at this moment, that means all of the upstream things that we should have been working on to prevent that, we've collectively failed. And so IOM, IOM is very uniquely positioned um, to try to work more on the prevention side. But that will require discipline um, from all of us, those who, who um, negotiate our budgets in, in parliaments and Congress, to member states, to see the value and the investment on the upstream um, side of things. So to, to put it very simply, no, I think we have a lot of work to do with our institutional partners, but we obviously deeply believe in Amy's leadership and think that she's a key piece to, to moving us forward, and I think we'll all be very excited to go together um, on that journey with her. Thank you so much. Um, and on the second question, on broadening the scope of the conversation. Sian, you want to? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, uh, for that important question. And uh, I think the key uh, point you highlighted, which is quite critical for our region, is the importance of silencing the gun for effective, productive regional integration and human mobility. So the way I take this is, uh, I think we need to have uh, a kind of two simultaneous approaches going at the same time. Since we don't have time and we cannot afford to wait till all the guns are silenced, we need to pursue the regional integration, economic development efforts. And, but at the same time, conflict, we know it is so destructive. It's one of the leading causes of displacement, migration in our region. And also, it comes with all kind of distractions that could be avoided. So in my opinion, Regional integration provides an excellent opportunity for countries to see the joint destruction conflict brings and to stand together against it. And in the context of Africa, we have seen ECOWAS countries doing it in West Africa. They have a very strong stand when it comes to conflict, when it comes to coups, and so they really try to act strongly and to really discourage countries from going to that direction. So in my opinion, if we manage to pursue the regional integration agenda, actually, we can use it as a conflict prevention mechanism. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we're, we're well over time, but I want to invite our, uh, Mr. Mohammed Abdekar, the Regional Director of IOM's Regional Office of the East and the Horn of Africa, to please for some closing words before we um, go off to the reception. Thank you very much. Um, first, I have to maybe put Elizabeth on this spot because um, the U.S. government continues to be our largest contributor in Eastern Horn of Africa. If I look at between this year and the next two years, we have about over a billion dollars that is supporting all the countries in IGAD and the East African community. And while we were sitting here, she just approved another $1.9 million <laughs> uh, for, for areas of high return of Burundian refugees. That's just as we were speaking, we we're talking about that as well. So thank you for all the support we continue getting uh, from the US government. I'm not sure how many of you have watched Wakanda, the fictional African country. <laughs> and I always say, we'll get there one day. And I say also that um, Africa is a continent of the future. <laughs> That's where we are. And if I look at our ambassadors who are here right now, and I'm always very proud to walk around with my East African passport. I think we're the first few regional communities that three countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda have come together and have one passport where we can move around. 
and also the ID cards. And that is very much about the regional integration that we're talking about um, every day as we speak here. The report took two years, and I remember having many meetings with Sion and the team on how we're going to make this something different. And uh, I said, you do your job, you're the ch chief editor. We'll try to get the political buy-in to make sure that we have our member states agree on every single thing that we put in that report. And working very closely with IGAD and East African community and each and every single member states, I was very impressed with the reaction we got from the member states. When we mentioned to President Ruto about this report, he said, give me a week to read it. I didn't believe he's going to read it, but after one week he came back and he said, I want to put the forward in that report because you're talking about what I believe in. For example, when we want Kenya Commercial Bank to work in Rwanda, when we want to have an equity bank for Kenya in DRC, when Ethiopia and Kenya signed the Safaricom to open up the first mobile private sector mobile company of Safaricom in Kenya, he said, the report talks to me. It tells me what my problem is. And also the report talks about climate change. And he said, I am hosting, he is hosting the first Africa Climate Summit on the 4th to 6th uh, of September this year. And he said, it talks to me. It's what we want to do. And last week, Amy and I were in, uh, in Cape Town. And it was interesting because as soon as I walked into the room, the first person I saw was someone from the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area. And the first thing he says is, the next report has to be on migration and trade. Because we want to make sure that we break the barriers so the African continental free trade area, we have more and more governments ratifying that so we can open up the whole continent for trade and mobility for everyone else. I can tell you many more stories. But today, um, I've, you've heard from the panelists on the, on the benefits of the mobility dimensions of regional integration in Eastern Horn of Africa and its contributions to the implementation of the US policy and strategy in the continent and in the region as well. As the state of migration in Eastern Horn of Africa report demonstrates, regional integration holds a transformative potential to catalyze socioeconomic opportunities, move households out of poverty, and increase the shared prosperity of African countries, their citizens, and migrants themselves. Through mutual standard setting and cooperative frameworks, regional integration empowers African governments to tackle a range of joint challenges that intersect with mobility, from trade and economic development to addressing climate change, counter-terrorism, armed conflict, and transnational organized crime in ways that are true to the continent's aspirations, <coughs> development agenda, and the vision of African Renaissance. The US strategy toward Sub-Saharan Africa has made important strides in recognizing African leadership and agency in responding to these challenges. As the US seeks to deepen African partnerships, policies that support the continent's regional integration and mobility aspirations will go a long way to consolidate a United States strategy that is based on humility and trust for regional and continental visions and reflective of Africa's concerns and realities. Deepest thanks to our panelists today. Um, USIP, very grateful. Uh, my very good friend, um, Eskinda, USRI, USCRI, as our gracious co-hosts today. The East African community and IGAD as the report's co-publishers and the African policy community in Washington, D.C. for joining us here today. I won't stop you from what's going to happen next. <laughs> Please join us for a reception immediately following this panel to continue the conversation with the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. As he said, please join us for the reception. Thank you all for...